A frustrating part of my job is enabling implementation. What I mean is, rural roots can talk, climate solutions are farm solutions until we're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, we're a nonprofit. And we just don't have the money to give to agriculture producers so they can implement on farm climate solutions. If the public wants climate friendly agriculture, producers need support. Now, that support might not be far off now. I'm Derek Leahy, and in this episode of Rural Roots to Climate Solutions, we're talking about a national campaign calling on the Canadian government to put policies in place to support climate friendly farming. The campaign's name? Farmers for Climate Solutions. Rural Roots to Climate Solutions, Farmers for Climate Solutions, sounds like the exact same thing, right? Sounds like we just went through a rebranding. Well, they are very similar, as you're going to discover in this episode, but Farmers for Climate Solutions is like Rural Roots, but on steroids. Rural Roots, as probably a lot of you know, provides learning opportunities for Alberta's agriculture producers and the communities they live in to find out how they can benefit from climate solutions. Farmers for Climate Solutions, which actually had its campaign launched today, February 11th, 2020. This is a cross-Canada coalition of groups calling for policies to be either improved or created in the country to support agriculture producers from coast to coast to coast in implementing climate solutions. Not only is this rural roots on steroids, it's also rural roots with a bit more teeth to it. We, so Rural Roots, we haven't really waded into policy change so far. Although a lot of us do realize that policy change is badly needed. Like I said in the intro, the thing that's bothered me the most with this, running this project, is we haven't really been able to help with implementation. We want producers to use land management practices and adopt farm technology that's good for the farm and good for the climate, but we don't want anybody to go broke doing it. I think uh, Steve Canyon, who's a livestock farmer in Busby, Alberta, he did a really good job of summing all this up in our farmer's blog. And if you haven't checked this out yet, you should really check out the article that uh, Trina Moyles and Steve Canyon did together. It's really great. But he he does a good job of explaining the current situation for producers who are trying to do right by the land. So this is what Steve said. There's a balance between the environmental side of what I'm doing and the economic side. We have to be able to do both. As I've said for years, I can clean the air and the water and do these wonderful things, but I can also go broke doing it. There's a big economic component to what I teach as well. And that's what I think a lot of younger farmers need to keen up on. We have to be able to make a living doing this or else it just won't last. We've got to have the economic component as well. I couldn't have said it better myself. And I'm not saying that producers are looking for a handout. But right now, I would argue there are many producers who are providing us for free with ecosystem services like clean water and climate change mitigation and adaptation services like sequestering carbon in soil. Sure, these things help agricultural operations. I'm not disputing that. But farm debt is a real and growing thing and over half of producers in Alberta have off-farm jobs, and many of them need these off-farm jobs to keep their farms and ranches going. I also feel we haven't fully unleashed the power of agriculture producers to take on climate change or protect ecosystems. Those two things, as important as they are, are just not the things that pay in agriculture right now. Right now, it's more or less all about volume, so how much a producer can produce. In my gut, I know, or at least I feel, that producers would be able to up their environmental game if doing so contributed more to them earning a living. I've seen it on the farms I've been on in Alberta. I've seen it in the eyes of the producers I've worked with, that that wish, that longing to do more for the land, but just not having the cash to do it. Maybe Farmers for Climate Solutions will change this. Maybe things are already starting to change. I haven't been involved in agriculture long enough to make that call. The timing of this campaign could not be better, by the way. 
public interest in climate issues and local food issues probably has never been higher in Canada. The timing of the campaign is also a little suspicious. Rural Roots to Climate Solutions broke out onto the egg scene in February of 2018. And now in February of 2020, a national campaign doing almost the exact same farm solutions or climate solutions thing is launched. Coincidence? I think not. I asked Jane Rabinovich, executive director of Seed Change, one of the coalition members, about this. I'm just curious. <laughs> so to you, okay. I just feel like the idea you guys have, you know, uh, providing information out there for farmers about farm solutions or climate solutions, it sounds mm-hmm. a lot like what we're doing. So I'm just curious, right. will uh, Rural Roots to Climate Solutions be receiving any sort of royalty payments <laughs> in the future as this campaign evolves? Uh, you know, I, I really, I can't say what the future holds. Okay. Um, one thing, what, what's that story about, uh, you know, you've got a couple people on an island or like, you know, someone has an, an idea, like, you know, different people simultaneously kind of having the same idea at the same time because that's just the right thing to think. Uh. Um, I'm just not sure that, um, you know, a case that 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 Rural Roots came up with the idea, then we came along and kind of borrowed from it would stand up in court. I think it's more <laughs> I think it might be more a case of uh it, it so happened that this is an urgent thing to be paying attention to, and a number of us kind of came up with um, similar ways of, uh, of of framing things around the same time. And it's just so exciting that we're able to collaborate together um, <laughs> to move this, this that was stuff such forward. Such like a great diplomatic <laughs> answer. There. Listen, <laughs> hopefully they still want us as a coalition partner. I'm just messing around. Rural Roots is really proud to be part of this. There's so many great groups on the roster. Seed Change, National Farmers Union, Farm Folk City Folk in BC, Ecological Farmers of Ontario Association, Ikatea in Quebec, and Canadian Organic Growers. If I forgot to mention someone, I'm really sorry about that, by the way. I could definitely see this list growing as things move forward. One, it has to if this campaign is going to be a success. Two, Who couldn't get behind the idea of supporting agriculture producers and putting climate solutions into action? It seems like a bit of a no-brainer to me. All right, let's jump into the rest of my interview with Jane Rabinovich of Seed Change. A couple things about the recording. It took place last December in Ottawa when I was visiting my family out east. At that time, the tentative name of the campaign was Farming Climate Solutions. It went through a bit of a revision since then. So every time you hear us say farming climate solutions, we're talking about farmers for climate solutions. They're the exact same thing. Now, I like the name change. It's a bit more action oriented, which I think speaks volumes about the type of people producers are. I usually try to tell folks, you know, I've been an organizer in the climate movement, the food security movement, and now I'm an organizer in the agriculture movement. And this is what I've observed about those different movements. The climate movement is just so good and awesome at creating and executing campaigns. The food movement just felt happier to me, which, yeah, it makes sense. They get to work with food. Now, the agriculture movement, well, farmers just get get done. So what exactly is this change that you're trying to seed? Uh, The ultimate goal is to affect policy change to achieve climate targets through agriculture. Um, And so we recognize that uh, farmers are on the front lines of climate change. Uh, farmers in Canada are some of the first to feel the impacts of climate change on their farms, on their bottom lines. Uh, farmers are in a very good position to speak to climate impacts and also to speak to innovations that they're practicing um, on their farm to mitigate climate change and then also the kinds of supports that they need to both adapt and then also to decrease uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture that contribute to climate change. So the ultimate goal is policy change. Um, How we get there is celebrating farmer voices and talking about climate impacts and also talking about climate solutions, sharing, you know, sharing farmer stories and celebrating their leadership, building a very strong constituency of Canadians that support farming climate solutions 
and then engaging decision makers to to adopt policies, to pass policies, to refine policies, to implement policies that allow us to help uh, Canada achieve climate targets through agriculture. Okay, so and for policy change, are we just talking about on a federal level or do you see this working on both levels like federal and provincial? Because it's a joint jurisdiction, I mean, we will be talking about both. One of the big uh, policy frameworks that we'll be looking at is the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, or whatever it will be called (laughs) um, in its next iteration. And so the next version will be set to launch in 2023. So one of the things that our campaign will be doing um, over the course of 2020 and beyond is engaging uh, decision makers about the next iteration of CAP. Um, And that'll be played out at the federal level and at the provincial level. And that's why uh, the campaign, um, the only way to succeed is to have national partners and then also uh, really strong uh, regional partners as well. Okay, cool. And I'm like curious how it all came about. Like, I remember I met up with you guys in Winnipeg way back in April of 2019. Mm -hmm. But you Mm -hmm. guys, I felt like the conversation had started like way before uh, I met up with you guys. So, yeah, I'm just really curious. Like, I was so happy to hear it was happening. It's like, oh, we're not alone. There's other people well, doing this. We were really excited to find out about you guys, actually, because I think, um, you know, not to, you know, put a plug for Rural Roots, but... Yeah, it's okay to do that. <laughs> <laughs> from from what I know, you guys are the only program or project in Canada that is exclusively about... Um, rural communities, farmers talking to each other about these issues, creating that kind of safe space. Like I think, you know, we had, we had these ideas. And then when we um, came across you guys as an organization that was actually already implementing this kind of thinking, like um, in community, like on the ground, uh, it was, we were super, super excited. Um, But yeah, no, it it was, uh, I think two, three years ago, we, we were just kind of noticing, okay, there's this obviously, um, increasing alarm around climate change. Um, we're noticing the cops. We're noticing that we have a federal gov- government that's really wanting to, you know, engage on this and, and provide leadership. Um, and then, you know, as agricultural as organizations, as an agricultural um, organization, we're looking at it and being like, well, where's ag in mm. the conversation? You know, um, where are we talking about climate impacts in, in agriculture? Where are we talking about um, agriculture's contribution? Where are we talking about opportunities for agriculture to provide solutions? So it was just, it was like a real gap. Mm. Um, and so that's where we started noticing the gap. And then we started saying, well, again, we work directly with growers. Growers are impacted. Growers are already innovating. They need support. So what can we do about it? And so, so, so you know, just talking to more and more people, it's so crazy because, you know, we're, you know, sitting here today, it feels like everybody's talking about about it now. Mm. Um, we've been in conversation with other regional organizations, other national organizations that have been having kind of similar conversations in parallel. So now it feels like the conversation is is out there in a much in, in, a, in a relatively big way. Um, but it was a very different situation a year ago. Totally. I don't know if, if you would kind of observe the same thing. No, I totally agree that all of a sudden, I, I think maybe just because for the most part, people wrote off agriculture, like, no, no, it's just a climate, it's a climate uh, criminal or mm-hmm. cause. It's not mm-hmm. so much a climate solution, but then all of a sudden people remember like, oh yeah, we need carbon to grow food. That stuff gets into the ground. And yeah, of course, agriculture does cause some problems. Like I, I full well admit that. But uh, yeah, looking at it as a solution that, I don't know why it took so long, actually. I don't have a good answer myself either. Mm-hmm. I think... I mean, one of the worst things that we can do is point the finger at farmers for causing, you know, quote unquote, mm-hmm. causing climate change. Agriculture is not an inherent, you know, problem. You know, so I, mm-hmm. I think that that's one of the dynamics that's being created by right now in some of the discourse. Agriculture it doesn't, by definition, have to produce tons of greenhouse gas emissions. A- agriculture, by definition, doesn't have to be, um, you know, it's not a inherently a destructive act Mm. um and i think that's actually really insulting to producers to you know hear language like that when um many have been on their land for generations and take their stewardship of the land very very seriously Mm. so i think it's also a a, you know there's it's, it's time now to shift that discourse um and to really again seize the opportunities um, that agriculture presents as a source of solutions for climate change. Mm, 
I also wonder sometimes if that finger pointing is also the result that like there's so few of us connected to farms mm-hmm. these days. Like I, I, I got into farming five years ago. I didn't grow up in a farming family and the stats are kind of crazy. Like uh, last I saw at a presentation uh, back in Alberta was like in the thirties, one in three people were involved in agriculture. And now it's like one in 50 and that, like, that gap keeps getting bigger and bigger. So yeah. I think having that disconnect from the food system probably caused a lot more problems too. Yeah. Yeah, the last I heard is that it's less than 1% of Canadians mm, who farm. Sense, yeah. I think that there should be some kind of like mandatory urban-rural exchanges in like elementary school or high school or something oh, like yeah. that. Because I really like, you know, the urban-rural divide is real. Um, and I don't think it's getting us anywhere uh, in terms of responding collectively to to this urgency now that climate change presents. Mm, I agree. And I actually get that question sometimes from urban environmentalists, like how do we bridge the divide? And I don't really have a good answer. I, the best answer I can give is just like, just show up for stuff. Mm-hmm. Like there is stuff going on in like rural Ontario, rural Quebec, rural Alberta, other parts of Canada too. Mm-hmm. And just like being present and actually being interested in their lives and what they're doing, I think, I think is one of the first steps, mm-hmm. but I, I could totally be wrong about that too. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think that you can really understand unless you've, you know, participated in some way. So uh, one thing I, I found very cool, and once again, it's so, also riffing off our sort of farm solutions or climate solutions, mm-hmm. or at least that message that we're putting out there is how with uh, farming climate solutions, you guys are trying to tackle two crises or crises at the same time. So you have the farm crisis on one side. So mm-hmm. farm debt, uh, farm populations going down. Farm income's not the greatest at the moment, but we also have the climate crisis. Mm-hmm. And I, I find with a lot of campaigns and maybe just a lot of things in life, people like dealing with things in isolation, but actually putting two together at the same time. I'm just curious why the coalition or the initiative decided, mm-hmm. OK, we're going to try and tackle both these things at the same time as opposed to tackling them separately with two separate campaigns. Mm-hmm. I've. I have a feeling that it's probably similar to why you guys have done that. But anyway, you can you can speak to that. <laughs> correct, correct me if I'm wrong here. But to me, it's a, if you're if it's the campaign is about um, the farmer experience first. And the farmer experience is about, you know, it's about the environment. It's about the weather. It's about climate. It's about um, what's happening on the farm. And, and of course, the farm experience is also about the lively their livelihoods. And so I just... You know, would anybody else in any other sector um, be asked to change their practices for purely, um, you know, environmental reasons Mm. if it meant, you know, a massive change to their livelihood or diminishing livelihood or, you know, exposing their children and grandchildren to um, risk and insecurity? So I just I, I, I don't I don't I don't see how you could show up and say to a producer hey, um, you know, number one, your practices are problematic. Mm. And number two, you need to change them um, to benefit the rest of us. I just don't, Mm. I just, I I just, I I don't think that's respectful. Mm. Um, I don't think that's a good way of, uh, to work with people. And I also don't think that it's reflective of the reality of, again, like the lived experience on the farm and what people are dealing with. So I think it's really important to put out there what's happening with, demographic so what's happening in terms of Canada losing farmers over time and over generations and the kind of um, potential food insecurity that that could create what's happening in terms of you know farm incomes and farm debt um, mm. and and to and to and like what's going on in our agriculture sector and then how do the systems that contribute to that experience for farmers how are those systems the same as the systems that are a, a huge part of agriculture's contribution to climate change. So when you when you when you look at the situation from the kind of farm experience, and you look at some of the dynamics, you actually realize that there's a real direct link between you know farm debt or like the you know the farm crisis, as the NFU calls it, mm-hmm. and the climate crisis, and that you know the only real way to move forward is is talking about um, farm economics at the same time as talking about environmental benefit. Mm, no, I totally agree. And like that, that report that the NFU did, like I almost got through it. I've been yeah. reading it uh, on train rides here and <laughs> yeah. there, but it's awesome. And I think it, it did bring up a good point that like 
as the farm debt grows, you can actually see emissions growing too from the mm-hmm. agricultural sector just because the costs that they had to give out for chemical inputs like mm-hmm. fertilizer and pesticides just kept getting bigger and bigger mm-hmm. and bigger. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's hard to tackle one without looking at the other two. Exactly. The report we're just talking about there is called Tackling the Farm Crisis and the Climate Crisis, a Transformative Strategy for Canadian Farms and Food Systems. It was actually written by an agriculture producer in Saskatchewan. His name's Derek. Derek, yeah. It was me. No. Darren Qualman for the National Farmers Union, or the NFU. The NFU, if, if you're not familiar with them, it's a national organization made up of agriculture producers from across Canada that pushes for things like safeguarding family farms, promoting environmentally safe farming practices, giving female farmers an equal vo- voice in shaping farm policy, working for fair food prices, empowering rural youth, and building healthy, vibrant rural communities. I was fortunate enough to be at the official launch of the report in Winnipeg last November. It was the NFU's annual convention, their 50th anniversary, if I recall. It was a really cool experience for me personally, just because it was the first time since I started with Rural Roots that I witnessed people other than us beating the climate solutions or farm solutions drum. I really felt like I was with my people that day. That report is pretty amazing. I I highly recommend reading it if you get a chance. It's about 100 pages. I haven't finished it yet myself, but it's really well researched and it saved me a lot of Googling. Uh, For this episode, I'm just going to refer to the the report the whole time just because there's some great stats in there. Now, as me and Jane were saying... Farmers for Climate Solutions is trying to tackle the farm crisis and the climate crisis at the same time. I think the climate crisis is fairly well understood by this point. I wouldn't say the same thing for the farm crisis, so let's dive into that. As I'm talking about these stats from the report, just try and keep in mind, uh, these are stats for Canada, not just Alberta. So producers. Producers off-farm jobs contribute more to their overall income than actual farming does. That doesn't mean producers are rolling in cash because Canadian farm debt has doubled since the year 2000. Overall, nationally, it stands at about $100 billion right now. The number of young farmers has been decreasing, which, again, I think a lot of people know about this already, but the numbers dropped about 68% since 1991. Uh, Young farmers were talking about people from about the ages about 15 to 35. So, not me. The average age of a Canadian farmer is 55 years of age, and most farms don't have succession plans. I think the stat that got to me the most was gross farm revenue versus net income for producers. Gross farm revenue, so the money that a producer pulls in when he or she sells their product. It's never been higher. It's way up in the tens of billions right now net farm income, so what a producer takes home after paying for costs like chemical inputs, fuels, etc. This has been dropping like a rock since the 1960s. It's less than $10 billion right now, which sounds like a lot, but you got to keep in mind there's that $100 billion farm debt. The report concludes, and I'm quoting the report here, the 40-plus year experiment in high output, high input, High cost food production has been a bust for farmers. So, you know, you can say that from the problem point of view, but then from the solution point of view as well, Mm -hmm. it says, well, you know, climate friendly farming is also going to be more friendly to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's evidence that backs that up as well. And so, you know, I think that that can provide some we we can't only be talking about the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, We also have to be presenting solutions and offering supports to to get there. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think there's a good news story you know, uh, I guess uh, good news kind of flip side of it, you know, the the same practices that are causing farm debt and causing high emissions. Um, when we change practices, it's going to be better for livelihoods and it's also going to be better for the environment. Mm. I'm happy you actually use that climate friendly agriculture. I just had a funder ask me what the heck that was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, is that the same thing as regenerative agriculture? <laughs> right. I'm like, well, part of it is, but regenerative agriculture is more focused on the soil and restoring ecosystems, mm-hmm. whereas when I think of uh, climate-friendly agriculture, it's that, but it's also like renewable energy or passive solar greenhouses that don't produce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. 
in, in theory, I guess they don't do a heck of a lot for the soil, but it, like that kind of falls into that overarching thing of climate friendly agriculture. But I don't know what you call it. I guess I, I don't want to call it sustainable agriculture just because mm-hmm. that word sustainable gets thrown around mm-hmm. a lot. But mm-hmm. yeah, I'm happy to hear somebody else actually say climate friendly agriculture. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think we're all playing around with our terminology right now mm-hmm. and trying to figure out what the right words are to describe the. And I, I, I think that one of the. One of the things that has to be said, too, is that there's no one solution. Mm. Um, there's no silver silver bullet to this. It's about a suite of practices. It's going to be about a suite of, you know, policy solutions as well. Um, and so, you know, climate-friendly agriculture, it's not like one specific form of, of agriculture. It could be, you know, a conventional producer who's, who's working to... Um, you know, decrease uh, input use, again, to decrease emissions and then also um, decrease costs. It could be folks transitioning to certified organic, not certified, you know, Mm. ecological agriculture, um, folks who are really excited about um, regenerative land use. So I think we really have to be thinking about a suite of practices that um, support, because, you know, the the sector is diverse. Um, And so, and, and everybody needs to transition wherever you're at. There's stuff to do to help our food system, mm-hmm. you know, be resilient in the face of climate change. And so, you know, for me, climate friendly farming is one way, you know, to as it, like to provide an umbrella term for a suite of you know, practices and systems um, as opposed to just one thing. So what is this climate-friendly farming that we're talking about? Because it's not really a defined term at the moment. So I'm going to refer to that NFU report again. But while I'm explaining this, just try and keep in mind, and I've said this before, agriculture doesn't really have a carbon dioxide problem. It's more of a methane and nitrous oxide problem. When we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, I mean by that. Methane, it's largely produced by cattle. Nitrous oxide... mainly coming from those synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. Overall, agriculture is about 12% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. That puts agriculture in like a three-way tie with electricity and heavy industry for being the fourth largest emitter in Canada. One thing I liked about the report is I haven't come across anything that says we have to stop growing corn or stop growing canola or stop raising cattle. It's all about how we produce food that's going to need to change. It's also the whole, well, what Nicolette Han Neiman said in episode one of our podcast. It's not the cow, it's the how. Listen to episode one, by the way. It's a really good one. So we're going to have to reduce the amount of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers we use in order to reduce nitrous oxide emissions. And we could do this by including legumes and uh, perennials in our rotations, using precision farming applications, using those four R's, and increasing organic and other low-input cropping systems. Now, intercropping, cover cropping, and reduced tillage, they're all in there too. It also takes energy to create those synthetic fertilizers, so we'll need to shift to using cleaner sources of electricity to produce the limited amount of fertilizers we'll be using in the future. On the livestock front, the the cattle front, the whole dealing with methane thing, yep, the report does say we probably have too many cattle and their numbers will likely need to be reduced somewhat and beef consumption may also have to decrease somewhat. But the report does put an interesting idea out there that through better herd health, improved genetics, and aggressive calling, we can get more beef per cow. I'm assuming uh, addressing food waste fits in here somewhere too. Improving pastures by seeding legumes, adaptive multi paddock grazing, using manure and things like biodigesters to create energy, and exploring feed additives that reduce methane production are also on the list of possible actions. I know some of this sounds like we're I'm tiptoeing around the whole methane issue here, that a lot of these actions might only slightly reduce methane, and you know methane is a huge problem, as is nitrous oxide. But because cattle play an important role in maintaining healthy grassland ecosystems, you got to remember, the prairies evolved those big herds of bison moving around and grazing grasslands. The report says... If the oil and gas sector reduces its methane emissions, 
it'll free up some space for methane emissions from cattle. Personally, I'm really curious to find out about the potential for those methane sequestering soil bacteria that Dr. Edward Bork talked about in episode 24 of our podcast. Also a great episode to check out if you get a chance. There are other actions in the report that fall into climate-friendly agriculture, like uh, cranking up energy efficiency on farms, shortening food, livestock, and grain transport distances, electrifying as many things as possible on farms, like tractors, like our heating, and making sure that electricity is coming from renewable energy sources. The potential policy measures, the report says, Canada could pass to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture reflect those actions and those practices I mentioned earlier. So I'm not going to go over the whole list. I do want to read my favorite one, though, because I think it sums up what the report is trying to say. Uh, This one they call reimagining agriculture. So we need to reject current policies focus on maximizing exports and production maximizing inputs, and minimizing the number of farmers. Instead, we need to substitute in a new approach focused on sustainability, reducing inputs and emissions, raising farm incomes, and increasing the number of farms and farmers. That kind of, this leads to a question I wanted to ask you later on, but uh, it's a complex problem with a complex solution. And at least my experience, and I, once again, I could be wrong about that. I just think people really suck with complexity. Sometimes it's really hard to get your head around. So because, mm-hmm. you know, there's a dominant narrative out there that like, OK, if agriculture is going to do its part for the environment, it's got to like, you know, ban beef and ban pesticides and mm-hmm. uh, fertilizers. But mm-hmm. looking at the report, the NFU did they're like, well, no, there, there's a role for cattle, less cattle. Yeah, sure. And same thing with uh, chemical inputs. They didn't say a complete ban. It's like, no, no, we just need mm-hmm. to use less of it. I'm just wondering if you're concerned for the longevity or the fate of the campaign, having a complex message right there. Because I'm assuming we need the support of the general public to do this because mm-hmm. farmers were like less than 1% of the population. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. are you worried at all that there could be some pushback or just the public won't get it? I mean, I think that that kind of nuance that you see in the report is because the report was produced by a farmer association and you wouldn't find a lot of farmer associations um, saying making those kinds of black and white assertions. Mm. Um, And I think it's just cutting out meat. You know, I don't love to talk about it too much because I know how. Uh, you're a vegetarian. I'm not. Now I remember. <laughs> no, I'm right. not. No, I'm oh, not. No, no. Oops, no. Sorry, I, I eat that, everything. Cut no. that part out later. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, I eat when I'm fed. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it's I under there's there's a lot of reasons that people cut meat out of their mm. diet. Um, there's a lot of reasons that people want to. Um, you know, decrease. Uh, you know, meat consumption, etc. And I think you know. Certainly decreasing meat consumption and looking at ways of, you know, managing livestock that are, again, more climate friendly are are certainly helpful. Um, But as a as as again, like as a farmer focused organization and a farmer focused campaign, it would just maybe it is attractive to put out really, really simple messaging and tell people, you know, like this with this one thing, we're going to solve the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, we would not have a leg to stand on with producers if that's the kind of messaging that we used. And it's also not true. Mm. So I, I think that, um, and there's also a, a real power in farmers telling their stories and speaking to their lived experience. I think a lot of urban consumers don't understand the role of livestock on the farm in terms mm. of fertility management and, and, and all of that. So I, my only hope has to be that there's an engaging and accessible way to like through storytelling um, to convey a somewhat, you know, some, some somewhat complex ideas in, in a, in a, in a, like effectively. Mm. I have to believe that's true. And I, and I really do think that, that we've got some beautiful videos as part of the campaign produced by the Prairie Climate Center. You know, there's going to be farmers again, sharing their stories directly and speaking to their own lived experience. And so I think, Um, storytelling is an imagery and video. Like, I think that's one of the best ways to, um, convey complex messaging in a really accessible way. No, I'd agree. And like the Prairie Climate Center is just such an awesome resource Mm -hmm. for that. So it's, it's great that they're involved in all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And as for uh, producers, so obviously what this is going to involve, or at least, you know, if you get the federal support, they get buy and stuff like that, like agriculture producers are going to need to change and shift their practices because uh, I don't think anybody's ever done a survey, but my assumption is, and I'm not expecting you to answer this either, but like most farmers probably aren't practicing 100% climate friendly farming. I'm going to go out there and say that, see what the blowback is. Right. Uh, but yeah, getting, I guess basically what do you think? Think, or what would you like to see from the federal government or provincial government? Uh, what kind of support do you think they need to provide for agricultural producers to make that shift? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one thing to say in terms of like, you know, getting agriculture, like producers to change their practices. I mean, the reality is agriculture is an evolving practice, mm. you know, over millennia. So producers are always adjusting and adapting um, to, you know, changing environments, environmental conditions, to changing markets, to you know, whatever the, whatever the case may be. So, you know, I think um, producers are really well placed to innovate mm -hmm. um, and to evolve. And I think we need to acknowledge that producers are always evolving and responding to, to, to new, you know, <laughs> to new realities and crises, diseases, pests, et cetera. So um, I think, you know, support with risk management. So identifying climate change as a risk and integrating support related to uh, climate risks um, into um, federal policy, um, support for transition. You know, people are talking about payment for ecosystem services mm. as part of the solution. People are talking about like research and development related to regenerative practices. Um, I'll do a little plug for my organization. Mm. Like we run <laughs> a national um, participatory plant breeding program where producers and researchers are working hand in hand to develop new varieties of um, field crops and vegetables that are bred for local climates and organic production. So, you know, boosting investments in, you know, climate friendly research and development. I think applying a climate looking at, I mean, the Canadian Agricultural Partnership is a well-funded program. You know, it's a it's a huge tool. And so what would it look like to apply a climate lens mm -hmm. um, to CAP? You know, the possibilities are endless. Supporting new, I mean, we have an intergenerational transfer problem that's happening um, in agriculture right now. We need to be supporting young people to get in and new farmers to get into agriculture. How do we support them coming in to specifically sustainable farming practices, um, et cetera? So, uh, t again, tons of tons of opportunity. Mm, okay. And I like I like throwing this question at folks sometimes, so feel free to answer, but okay. you don't have to. Uh, what do you think about raising food prices for something like this? Ooh. Uh, so may, help me make the link. How, how does, how is raising food prices linked to, uh, climate solutions in agriculture? Fair question. You took my question and turned it into <laughs> another diabolical. <laughs> uh, I guess it's just, um, so one of the biggest problems we face is like we, we do try and promote all these different, mm -hmm. uh, land management practices, farm technology, stuff like that. But uh, at the end of the day, on the implementation side, we're we're not affecting a heck of a lot just because it doesn't pay in some cases to do these things. And one of the problems right now is, is just there's this expectation in Canada and a lot of places in the West just for food to be cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess the theory you could throw out there is like if food costs more, people pay more for food producer gets paid more then they're not running around like a chicken with its head cut off mm -hmm. uh trying to just cobble together a living so they get paid more maybe mm -hmm. they can do more of these great things like mm -hmm. ecosystem goods and services protection uh climate friendly services and stuff like that mm -hmm. but it's a hard one in the sense because they're legitimately people in canada who can't afford food right now so mm -hmm. i wouldn't want to put them in a horrible situation mm -hmm. either i mean i think that the the thing on that that the the way where that kind of a approach falls short is if you actually look at what's been happening with food prices over the last whatever um, 50 years or more food prices have gone up okay. um, but that hasn't necessarily mean um, better incomes for farmers so mm. the the you know the revenues from higher food prices the benefits are not being captured by farmers and so if if food prices went up I wouldn't necessarily then make the link that farm incomes are going to go up and that's mm. going to help farmers that's a fair point. I, Adapt. You know, I, I don't think the data would back up that connection. No, and I think, 
I've heard that same argument against like a carbon tax that mm-hmm. it's just like the polluter who's supposed to pay is just going to pass on that uh, cost onto the consumer itself. Mm-hmm. So um, mm-hmm. we're not opening up a discussion no, about, carbon pricing. about carbon pricing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're not going to yeah. you're not going to fool me into that one. <laughs> I already talked about livestock. Yeah, right. <laughs> I've <done, laughs> taken my I've taken my one for the fair team. Enough, fair yeah. enough. <laughs> So far, we've only talked about addressing the climate crisis, but how does this all help us deal with the farm crisis? For crop production for cattle, the recommended land management practices do help to build soil health, so it's definitely a good thing for the farm. The report also mentions paying producers per acre for taking ecologically sensitive land out of production, like the the whole Alice Canada thing. For crop producers having to spend less money on chemical inputs because they're using less chemical inputs is going to be good for the old bank account. For cattle producers, it's a bit trickier. Getting more beef per animal unit is definitely a good thing. But the report actually says we have to, and I'm quoting the report here, restructure the cattle sector so that fewer animals support more farms and higher incomes. And uh, one thing, and we we were talking about this briefly just before Mm -hmm. we started recording, was this whole thing with natural climate solutions. Uh, I've been like loosely doing climate work for about a decade. Definitely do not remember hearing about that 10 years ago. I don't even remember hearing about that last year, but all of a sudden I'm hearing more and more about natural climate solutions. So I'm just yeah. curious, like, have you, do you know what's changed or why this is becoming something popular or any, any theories? Yeah, I mean, I have observed the same thing as you. So natural climate solutions or nature-based climate solutions. Mm. I think that there was, a, there was a big envelope of funding that was announced by the feds um, for, you know, nature-based climate solutions. So I, but I, I, I couldn't define it for you. Um, and I also don't know how it applies to agriculture. Mm. Um, and so that's something I think that you and I both have a duty. <laughs> I, mean, I think what this conversation reveals is that we don't know enough yeah, true. Um, and we should be looking into it because there are certainly what, the other thing that I'm observing, you know, I would say not even over the last year, like over the last six months, but then even accelerating over the last like two months to a few weeks is the increased participation of environmental groups in conversations about agriculture and climate and I, I'm curious to see where that goes. I mean, you're an interesting profile because you come from a, you've, you've done a lot of climate mm-hmm. work, and and then, um, and 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 you're bringing that to bear um, in farming. I don't know if traditional environmental campaigns approaches are going to be effective in again in farming climate solutions and finding um, climate solutions in agriculture. Like, I'm just kind of curious about that. So hmm. it's, I'm, I'm, I'm observing it. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like watching it. So I'm interested in, in, again, seeing the link between natural climate solutions and agriculture. Um, can producers benefit from some of the resources that have been set aside? So are we talking about, you know, nature-based solutions on agricultural land? Like, I don't know. Mm, okay. You know, enough. and I'm, the other thing, so I'm, I'm interested to see that kind of link. And I'm also interested to see how it plays out over time, this kind of increasing interest among environmental groups in agriculture. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause like, I don't know what, what I think about like sitting, uh, sorry, I've, I've always had this dream. Okay. That I wanted to <laughs> Like sit down some vegans, sit down some cowboys and say, (laughs) okay, you guys actually both really care about nature and the land. Could you guys just sort it out? Mm -hmm. I would not want to be the facilitator in that situation because I don't know how to navigate that. And then when I think about like environmental groups getting into more of the egg space, it's it's almost the same thing right there. It's Mm -hmm. just that the two groups that unfortunately I feel like have been butting heads and maybe that's a huge generalization. Mm -hmm. I feel like they haven't always been on the same page for a Mm -hmm. while and now they and I have to sit at the table and sort it out. And mm-hmm. but I don't know how you do that. I think to be effective in um, achieving environmental outcomes in agriculture, you need to be um, truly caring about the well-being of farmers and farming communities. And I think if you don't demonstrate a true interest in, in that, your approach is not going to be um, effective. So you, you, I don't think you can come to the table um, advocating for purely environmental outcomes. I think you have to be looking at the intersection between 
what's good for the planet and also what's good for farmers. And I'm just also curious, like I know there's a number of organizations involved in the coalition, mm-hmm. so they, they, they probably know what their roles are. I'm just curious for like the average Canadian or um, even the average farmer, like how do you support something like this? Or how, how could you envision people supporting something like this? I, once again, I realize it's early days. so mm-hmm. It's really hard to say how mm-hmm. that would look. I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, as, as you've said, the Farming Climate Solutions, you know, group um, has started off as a, as a, you know, a group of three, four organizations, but um, as you've been part of these long email threads, <laughs> the, the numbers are yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. The numbers are growing, um, and um, it's going to be. I think another key to success, as you say, is going to be having to have um, really clear calls to action for farmers. Mm. Um, so that's you know, share your story, tell us how you're being impacted, tell us what you're doing about it, tell us the kind of supports that you need. Having really strong you know, farmer ambassadors who are prepared to speak about this, because as you know, in your experience, it can be uncomfortable. Mm. Um, and so, you know, call to action to farmers to um, to share their stories and to participate um, in the early days. That's going to be really helpful. We want to see images, you know, we want to hear quotes, we want to hear stories, all of that stuff. And then for, you know, supportive non-farmers, I think early on, it's going to be sign up for the newsletter, add your name to this thing. What we want to see is a growing number of Canadians who are getting behind the campaign, Mm. Um, folks who are reading about it, hearing the information, you know, following, you know, folks on social media, et cetera, et cetera. And then when the time comes where there's something very specific um, that we're going to be asking people to do um, to respond. Okay. And I guess, yeah, if it does make it, well, where are we? 20. Oh, sorry. We're in 2020 right now. I forgot. (laughs) Gonna say 2019. Exactly. No. Oops. Uh, so the next federal election, which would be in like three years, then I guess that's even an opportunity too for the non-farming and far- farming population to say to those candidates, like, mm-hmm. "Hey, this is this is a thing. You should really mm-hmm. either get behind this or change your mind about it, one or the other." Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think you know the the conventional kind of thinking around this particular election was you know people going into the, this election were wondering, and how much is climate going to play. And I think, you know, the analysis following the the election was that it played quite a bit. um, And that, you know, this was the last election where it would even be a question that climate change was like, you know, a quote unquote election issue. So it's going to be on the agenda now moving forward for the foreseeable future. And I think Canadians are going to be looking to the federal government and all parties to be presenting their vision for how, you know, how Canada is going to respond. What we haven't seen I mean, absent in any party's platform was a vision for um, agriculture and climate. Um, So, and again, an acknowledgement of the impacts of climate change on producers um, and, you know, a vision for the role that agriculture can play in farming climate solutions. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, when we're looking ahead of a a few years to to the next federal election, it would be very nice to see the link between climate and agriculture reflected in the platforms and a clear vision because Canada has expressed very strong ambitions for growth in the agricultural sector. And Canada has also expressed very strong ambitions for climate leadership. And we have yet to see, you know, a vision for how those two things go together Totally disconnected. They have nothing to do with each other. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it's, you know, very inconvenient. Like, you know, it's, it's, you know, so it's like, it's like, it's been this, it's, you know, this kind of like black box or whatever. Like we're not going to talk about climate and agriculture. Mm. Um, and it would be very nice as a result of this campaign and the efforts of lots of um, other groups and other initiatives across the country um, for that to no longer be an option. So here's the, here's what you can do portion of the episode. If you're a person who supports Farmers for Climate Solutions and supports climate-friendly farming, but you're not involved in agriculture, you can spread the word on social media, and if you go to the website, you can sign the pledge. If you're an agriculture producer, you can do all that, plus you can share your story of the on-farm climate solutions you're using on your farm or ranch, or you can talk about how climate change has impacted your farming operation. It's actually quite similar to what we're doing at the Farmer's Blog. I'm I'm sorry, I'm going to give it another plug, but it's turning out to be a great experiment for us. If you haven't checked out the Farmer's Blog yet, please go check it out. 
Now, to get involved in the Farmers for Climate Solutions campaign, fairly simple. Just go to the website, which is farmersforclimatesolutions.ca. Well, the other cool thing about the campaign, like this isn't happening in isolation just in Canada. Like, Mm-mm. just you know, just recently we, we connected with this group in Australia that's like a decade ahead of us with this mm-hmm. stuff. I just saw their website and everything they're doing. Like, there's that. There's the, uh, we'll see, there's a one in France, like the four by 1000 initiative too, that th- this is something that I think like La Via Capucina has probably been doing this stuff way longer than I even I'm aware of, mm-hmm. but this is something that's been going on in a lot of different places throughout the world. So it's really cool to see that, that now it's like, it's going to hit the ground running in Canada as well. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn from, um, work that's been happening in other places. I was just made aware of the national sustainable agriculture coalition, um, in the States, oh, yeah. um, very similar, very cool logo. Um, And they just came out with a paper that's called uh, Agriculture and Climate Change Policy Imperatives and Opportunities to Help Producers Meet the Challenge. So I know, I know. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I think that there's a there's a lot of um, I was hearing yesterday about an example of um, because uh, there's a dialogue right now about crop insurance. Um, okay. And how and, you know, it's, it's obviously that's a Canada has a very kind of extensive crop insurance um, system set up. So how do we account for climate risks and is our crop insurance kind of frameworks, could, could they be used somehow to help in this process? So I was hearing a story about um, apparently a system um, uh in Italy, where and where the aim was to bring down the use of neonics, okay, um, and the system was for producers to not use neonics, and that they would instead be insured for their like lack of use of, for the potential mm. of a crop failure due to pest uh, infestation. Um, the premiums on the insurance are less than the cost of the input. Um, Mm. And then if you have the crop failure, there's a payout. So there's no risk to the producer. There's no use of the, of the neonic. And apparently the, the, there's a really low rate of actual crop failure. Interesting. So, I mean, I'm not, again, I just heard about this yesterday. Like I'm not in a, in a position to really speak about it, but I think um, there could be some creative solutions for us to, for us to take a look at and we should be drawing inspiration from what's happening in other places in the world. That's a really good point. Like there's not always, or I guess very rarely there's a need to like reinvent the wheel because there's, there's always like bits and pieces from other initiatives Mm -hmm. and other ideas. And yeah, I'm I'm actually really curious just to see what ideas come from the agricultural community itself that Mm -hmm. like maybe the NFU hasn't come across, maybe like rural roots hasn't come across Mm -hmm. and be like, damn, that's a really good idea. What do we think about that? So I think that's a really exciting thing about a campaign like this when when you give producers a platform to, to talk, because not only like nine times out of 10, they, he or she turns out to be like a brilliant speaker, even mm-hmm. though they pretend to be all shy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but some of the ideas they come up with, because they have to be so inventive and so creative all the yeah. time. It's just like that. that that's awesome. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that this particular moment in time presents a lot of opportunity for innovation. Mm-hmm. And my hope is that decision makers will support, will support that, will support innovation, will support um, experimentation. We've seen um, this living labs kind of pilot program that Ag Canada has been piloting okay. across the country, really kind of focusing on farmer led research. So there, I, I think there, there seems to be kind of a growing appreciation for um, farmer knowledge on farm research um, and innovation and development, et cetera. So mm. um, I think experimentation is necessary you know, for, for things like this to succeed. So hopefully the, there'll be appetite on the part of decision makers to support that as well. Yeah, I hope so too. And even like some, I don't know if de-experimentation is a word, but I'm going to use it. And okay. just as in the sense that uh, obviously like farms keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And some of this might be about, okay, this experiment with huge farms, maybe we should stop this and like kind of go back to more of a family farm style, mm-hmm. which yeah, but each has its own pros and cons. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I think it's, I wouldn't say one's necessarily a bad thing or the other, but it's just there's there's going to be growing pains in a situation like this where things need to change. And uh, that, that dominant narrative in agriculture for a while now, it's been like, go big or go bust. Mm-hmm. Like, even though the general public has this like ideal, idealized vision of like the family, family farm, farm and it's diverse, like mm-hmm. it, that's 
unfortunately very rarely the reality of agriculture mm-hmm. in Canada right now. But mm-hmm. some of these climate solutions we need to implement in agriculture actually mean trying to get back to something close to that. Like, I, I don't think mm-hmm. we have to go back to the way things were like in the 20s. I have no idea exactly how they were to begin with. Mm-hmm. But th- there is some of that, yeah, I guess, de-experimentation that we do need to kind of shrink things a little bit in, mm-hmm. in some cases. But. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's that's a tough proposition probably for a producer. Mm. Um, but, you know, and I think that there are folks who would say, we run a family farm on a very large acreage and totally. we're responsible stewards of the land. Yeah. So I think, I mean, what I've seen, I've seen, again, this is some sometimes where you get the rural urban divide where um, I think sometimes like city folks, it's like we'll speak in a way that's like big is necessarily bad. Mm. And I think that, you know, sometimes, and then you'll have producers who are saying, we'll say, well, you know, you can have, um, good practices and bad practices at all scales of production. <laughs> you know what point. I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I think really what, what we want to see is um, support to integrate, to implement good practice at all, all types of production and all scales of production, okay. you know, in a, at a really large acreage, um, you know, that presents a lot of opportunity mm. um, to implement good practices and have, you know, really big impacts. Mm. things like intercropping or things like whatever, just, di- you know, different kinds of practices. So I think, yeah, I think again, that's a, that's a, that's a place where, um, you know, we have to be careful with the language that we use and also offer supports for, again, producers of at all scales and all, you know, types of production. And then I think, you know, in terms of what do you do when you have a, a really, really big farm yeah, yeah, yeah. and, um, you know, and you're going to retire and, you know, it, like, I think it's always, it's, it's easier to go bigger than go smaller. Right. Totally. Um, yeah. you know, but is intergenerational transfer an opportunity to, um, you know, divvy up portions of land or help, you know, uh, give, you know, new farmers access to a certain, you know, portion of the, of the, of the acreage to farm or, you know, whatever it is, like, again, um, just thinking creatively in ways that actually fit with where, um, a given producer is at, you know? Mm. No, I agree. And like, just, yeah, you're right. Just cause it's big doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Like I, you, I, I guess you, if you look at a tractor, like, okay, right now a tractor is producing a ton of CO2, but as soon as we switch, switch to electric tractors, which is already happening, like mm-hmm. a, a meta guy the other day has got an electric tractor, cool. then that in itself, like that particular farmer, might still be able to farm 10,000 acres. So he or she's still going to have a huge farm, but they're doing it with electric tractors. Mm-hmm. So it's like in that case, like, oh, no, no, you're too big. I don't care if you're using electric or mm-hmm. not. So yeah, I think you're right. It's not so much, I don't know. It's not so much the, the size. It's the kind of the management practices that are going on. That's probably yeah. going to be the real determining factor with a lot of that. Yep. Leading us to a bigger question. Okay. Are we going to win? <laughs> I mean... Um, I don't even know how you answer that. You know, when I think about stuff like this, I think um, the only choice is to win. Good answer. Really? Like to me, there's an imperative here. Um, uh, There's an imperative to act, uh, you know, in defense of and in support of family farming in Canada, Mm. um, in support of the kind of food that we want to be eating, you know, for generations to come. And there's an imperative to act on climate. So I don't see an I don't see a no win option. Okay. Do you see this as a quick victory <laughs> or is this something that's going to take a number of years? I, I realize these things are also funding dependent. So mm-hmm. sometimes things just end because there's no money to fund it. But I mean, from the beginning, as you know, from our conversations, we're talking about a multi-year cam- campaign. Mm. So I don't think it's a quick victory. I think there's a couple of things that are working in our in our favor. Number one, um, consumers are buying more and more local and sustainable food. Um, number two, there's widespread acceptance that climate change is real. Um, there's a widespread desire to do something about it. And I think that um, one of the most powerful ways that everyday people see they're able to take action is in their food choices. Mm. So I I think there's a logical next step there, which is, you know, okay, I can make, I can make a difference for the, for the planet in the food that I eat on the, on the day to day. I can understand how this farmer 
is going to make a difference for the planet and how they produce the food that I'm eating on the day to day. So I think, again, changing consumer preferences and then also the awareness of the of, of climate and the link um, that people are making in their minds between climate and food mm. is, is going to help. Because, you know, there, there are three keys to success for a campaign like this. One is um, farmer leadership. Two is the support of Canadian constituency. Mm. And three is um, the engagement of decision makers who are willing to do something about this. Um, and I think that, again, it's early days, mm. but um, I think that we are in a good position to, to, to have those three pieces uh, in place. Not sure if this has come up on the podcast yet, but I spent most of my 20s working as a tour guide in Germany. My favorite place to give a tour was always Berlin. I'm a big fan of 20th century history, and it felt like Berlin managed to weasel its way into every major event of the 20th century. I was like a kid in a candy store there. A lot of those events were major turning points in history. Think of the the fall of the Berlin Wall, for example. I always wondered, and I still do to this day, did people know when the wall came down and in other major events in history that they were in a turning point of history? It's fairly easy to identify something as a turning point decades after it happens, but how do you know in that very moment you're in that you're living through a turning point, a moment that changes everything? I think the short answer is you don't know. I know I can be overly optimistic, and I'm definitely an overthinker. But I can't help wondering that years from now, or decades from now, will we talk about today, February 11th of 2020, as a turning point in Canadian agriculture, the day we started empowering agriculture producers to implement climate solutions that are good for the farm, good for our communities, and good for the land and everything that shares that land with us. A guy can dream, can he? Rural Roots to Climate Solutions is an Alberta-based project empowering agriculture producers and the communities they live in with climate solutions. Rural Roots is proud to be a project of the Stetler Learning Center in East Central Alberta, And we run workshops, farm field days, webinars, and we assist rural communities in developing their own renewable energy projects. And of course, we do this podcast. For more information about us, go to the website, which is www.rr2cs.ca. And for more information about Farmers for Climate Solutions, go to www.farmersforclimatesolutions.ca. The Rural Roots to Climate Solutions team is Angie O'Connor, Marie Golanka, Evelyn Tanaka, and myself, Derek Leahy. The podcast is funded by the Government of Alberta and Energy Efficiency Alberta. Most of this episode was recorded in Ottawa on unceded Algonquin territory. This episode was edited by Kieran Mountain of Mountain Media. Happy farming and happy agriculture day wherever you are in Canada. And remember... What's good for the climate is good for the farm.